decades now, we've been hearing about the need for a sustainable transition, but despite many efforts, it remained to be achieved. Our economic system remained mainly consumerist and based on competition for short-term profits and economic growth. Could it be that it is unfit for purpose to integrate our planetary limits and achieve a sustainable transition? Many new conversations are taking place about the need for systemic change. In this video, Jason Equal is presenting the concept of degrowth to the Netherlands Parliament. According to him, degrowth offers not only an opportunity to integrate our planetary limits, but could foster a better world for all. Mr. Hickel, I give the floor to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the, for the introduction and thank you all for being here. It's an honor for me to, to join you and thank you for those of you who are joining us in person. So um, we stand at an important and difficult juncture in history. The present direction of our civilization is clearly untenable and the solutions that are being promised by our political classes appear to be inadequate to the crisis that we face. But we're at an impasse, uncertain about what needs to be done and how to do it. The old world is dying and the new world is struggling to be born. Let us begin by facing the problem. We know that the global economy is driving dangerous ecological breakdown. We are presently at 1.2 degrees of global warming and already the effects are clearly disastrous. It's critically important that we make every effort to limit warming to 1.5 degrees in line with the Paris Agreement because we know that warming toward two degrees is highly likely to trigger several tipping points in the Earth system, including the collapse of the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets, coral reef die-off, and mountain glacier loss. And yet, according to the IPCC, existing government policies have us on track for 3.2 three, for 3 degrees of global warming this century in the lifetime of present generations. Humans have never lived on such a planet. Scientists warn of crop yield decline, widespread species extinction, human displacement, and political upheaval. And climate is not the only crisis we face. We're also overshooting five other planetary boundaries, including ecosystem degradation and a staggering collapse of biodiversity. Now, this is not because of ignorance or individual behavior or lack of concern. People care. People want to change course. But we are trapped by certain structural features of the capitalist system. And by capitalism here, let me be clear, I do not mean simply markets and trade and businesses. These things existed for thousands of years before capitalism, and they're innocent enough on their own. The key problem we face is that capitalism is organized around and dependent on perpetual growth, ever increasing levels of industrial production. If it does not grow, it collapses into crisis, causing unemployment and misery with devastating consequences for working class communities. This system is extremely unstable. It's also profoundly undemocratic. Under capitalism, decisions about what to produce and how to use our collective labor and resources are determined by those who own and control capital. And for capital, the purpose of increasing production is not primarily to improve people's lives or to achieve specific social and ecological goals. Rather, it is to extract and accumulate an ever-increasing quantity of profit. That is the overriding objective. And this arrangement overwhelmingly benefits the rich, of course, and also ropes us into perverse forms of production, uh, SUVs instead of public transit, advertising instead of affordable housing, fast fashion instead of nutritious food, and consumer electronics and white goods that are designed to break down in order to increase product turnover. This is what is driving ecological breakdown. We have an economy that massively overuses resources and energy, and yet remarkably nonetheless still fails to meet many basic human needs. It is irrational and inefficient. Now, scientists are clear that it is the rich economies of the global north that are overwhelmingly responsible for the ecological crisis. Their use of energy and resources is extremely high, several times over the sustainable boundaries and vastly in excess of what would be required to ensure decent lives for all. What is more, the constant hunt for more growth in the global north relies on a constant net appropriation of materials, energy, land, and labor from the territories of the global south. This drains poorer countries of resources that are necessary for developments. It colonizes their lands. It produces global inequality. 
And it means that the social and ecological costs of growth are offshored or externalized onto vulnerable communities. And yet note this, despite all of this immense production and appropriation, social problems remain entrenched. In the US, one of the richest countries in the world, a quarter of all people live in substandard housing and nearly half cannot afford healthcare. In the UK, 4.3 million children live in poverty. In the Netherlands, 1 million people do not have secure access to food. Why? Because the enormous productive capacity of these countries is mobilized to serve the interests of capital rather than to secure the well-being of people. Our economic system fails in both ecological and social terms. So what do we do? What does the new world look like? For 50 years, our ruling classes have promised that green growth will save us. They say that efficiency improvements will allow capital to continue increasing production and profits, while at the same time reducing ecological impacts back to sustainable levels. It sounds nice, but of course it hasn't happened. And today, scientists challenge this narrative on empirical grounds. Let's talk first about emissions. Yes, several high-income countries have been increasing their GDP, while at the same time reducing emissions, even in consumption-based terms. The Netherlands is one of them. Politicians and media have hailed this as evidence of green growth, but this narrative is scientifically incorrect. Yes, of course it is possible to absolutely decouple GDP from emissions, simply by shifting to lower carbon sources of energy. This has been happening in some countries since the 1990s. It's not news, it is fully expected. The problem is, when it comes to climate mitigation, what matters is speed. To meet the Paris Agreement goals, nations need to cut their emissions fast enough to stay within their fair shares of the global carbon budget for 1.5 degrees. For high-income nations, this is extremely challenging precisely because they have such high levels of energy use. None of them are on track to meet the Paris goals, not even close. At existing rates of emissions reductions, the Netherlands will take 200 years to reach net zero and will burn its fair share of the carbon budget seven times over. If all nations were to overshoot their carbon budgets like the Netherlands is on track to do, we would, we would be headed for around four degrees of global warming. There's nothing green about this. It's a recipe for disaster. We need much faster rates of mitigation. And the plain truth is that growth makes this task extremely difficult to achieve. And the reason for this is simple. It's because more production means more energy demands than would otherwise be the case. And more energy demands makes rapid decarbonization harder. It's like trying to run down an escalator that is accelerating upwards against you. So green growth proponents know this is a problem and they deal with it in several ways. First, they assume that efficiency improvements can be ramped up to historically unprecedented levels and this will be enough to do the job. But this claim is not supported by empirical literature. Studies have repeatedly shown that in a growth-oriented economy, savings from efficiency are leveraged or reinvested to expand the process of production and accumulation, which wipes out much of the gains and makes progress very difficult to achieve. Second, green growth scenarios assume a mass deployment of speculative negative emissions uh, technologies, mostly bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. But scientists warn that this approach comes with several major problems. It would require biofuel plantations up to three times the size of India, okay? Dramatically exacerbating deforestation, biodiversity loss, and constraints on human food systems. Moreover, if negative emissions schemes fail, then we're stuck in a hothouse trajectory from which it would be impossible to escape. It's an extremely dangerous gamble with the future of human civilization. Third, Green growth scenarios maintain unnecessarily high levels of energy use in rich countries and among the rich by suppressing energy use in the global south and by appropriating southern lands for biofuel plantations. This approach perpetuates colonial inequalities. It is immoral, unjust, and unacceptable. Finally, even if we imagine all of these problems away, we have to deal with another issue. Regardless of the type of energy we use to power our economy, more growth means more material extraction, which is the single biggest driver of biodiversity loss and ecosystem damage. Several major scientific reports have found that sufficient reductions in material use 
are unlikely to be achieved if rich nations continue to pursue increased aggregate production. So this is not good enough. We can and we must do better. We cannot just ignore science. We cannot just ignore injustice. We need solutions that deal with the ecological crisis and the social crisis together. In its latest report, the IPCC points to scholarship on degrowth as an alternative path. Degrowth research, let me specify, embraces efficiency improvements. It embraces technological innovation. But it recognizes that this alone will not be enough, and therefore also calls for rich nations to abandon GDP growth as an objective and scale down destructive and less necessary forms of production to reduce energy and material use directly. Now remember, GDP is an aggregate metric. It does not distinguish between $1,000 worth of bombs and $1,000 worth of healthcare. Even the man who invented GDP himself warned that this metric should never be used to measure social progress. Because in reality, it's not aggregate production that matters, but rather what we are producing, whether people have access to the essential goods they need, and how income is distributed. So instead of blindly chasing GDP growth and hoping this will magically solve our social and ecological problems, let us be clear about what we actually want to achieve and target those things directly. This focuses the minds on what is important. For degrowth transition, the goal is to organize the economy around human well-being and ecology with three core values, equality, sufficiency, and economic democracy. Okay? So the first step is we need to decommodify and expand and improve essential public services, healthcare, education, housing, public transit, clean energy, water, internet, nutritious food. Mobilize the productive forces to ensure that everyone has access to these things they need to live a good, dignified life, regardless of fluctuations in aggregate output. This stabilizes the economy. It directly cuts the cost of living and improves the welfare purchasing power of income. Second, introduce a climate job guarantee with workplace democracy and living wages. The goal here is to empower people to train and participate in the most important collective projects of our generation, building renewable energy capacity, insulating homes, restoring ecosystems. This is urgent, socially meaningful, socially necessary forms of production. This approach abolishes unemployment. It abolishes economic insecurity. It improves the bargaining power of labor. It delivers high well-being for all and enables us to pursue radical climate policy without anyone getting hurt. This is the bread and butter of a just transition. In other words, we need to improve socially necessary sectors, and with this foundation in place, we can then scale down socially less necessary sectors, right? Private jets, SUVs, airlines, mansions, beef, fast fashion, advertising, arms, single-use packaging, the practice of planned obsolescence. In other words, forms of production that are organized mostly around capital accumulation and elite consumption, and which are largely irrelevant to human well-being. As part of this, we can also introduce policy to extend product lifespans and guarantee rights to repair. If our products last twice as long, then we need half as many, uh, with no loss to our access to important things. Next, we need to curtail the purchasing power of the rich. Mr. Using, Hickel, yes. Um, you said you would need it around 10 minutes. We're going ah, uh, I was a told, bit over the. Uh, I was told 15. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. Well, uh, continue. I'm, I'm then. concluding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We need to curtail the purchasing power of the rich using policy tools such as wealth taxes and maximum income ratios. Now, this may sound radical, but think about this. Right now, millionaires alone are projected to devour 72% of the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees. This is an egregious assault on humanity and the living world. We need to realize that it is irrational and unjust to continue to devote energy and resources to supporting an overconsuming class in the middle of an ecological emergency. So policies like these would dramatically reduce energy use. They would allow us to achieve a much faster transition to renewables. And as our society requires less aggregate production, we can shorten the working week, give people more free time, and share necessary labor more evenly. This approach has been shown to have strong, positive effects on mental health, uh, physical health, and gender equality. Finally, the central pillar of degrowth scholarship is economic democracy. Democratize workplaces, democratize finance, 
democratize public services, democratize the media. We know empirically that when people have democratic control over production, they choose to use resources more wisely. They focus on what is required for human welfare and they sustain ecosystems into the future. Radical democracy is the antidote to a socially and ecologically destructive economy. Now this may sound utopian, but know this, the policies I've listed here happen to be extremely popular. Universal services, a green job guarantee, working time reduction, living wages, an economy focused on well-being and ecology rather than growth. Polls and surveys show strong majority support for these ideas. And official citizens' assemblies in Spain and France have called for precisely the kinds of transition that I've suggested. With this path, we can build a more efficient, more rational, more just economy that ensures good lives for all within planetary boundaries. People often say that 1.5 degrees is dead. That there's no feasible path to sufficiently rapid uh, decarbonization. But this is only true if we continue to assume growth in rich countries. If we liberate ourselves from this assumption, then 1.5 degrees is back on the table. Models show that with post-growth, post-capitalist transition, we can achieve our ecological goals and improve social outcomes at the same time. It is technologically feasible. It is ecologi ecologically coherent. It is socially just and it is decolonial. This is a future worth fighting for. But none of this will happen on its own. It will require a political movement that unites environmentalists with labor unions and working class formations. It will require a struggle against those who benefit so prodigiously from the status quo. It will require organizing and it will require courage, but so has every movement for a better world. Thank you. Uh, how would you have uh, the means as a government in order to push for a, gr a green agenda um, when you wouldn't have a growth scenario? Mr. Hickel, and may I ask you also to be maybe a bit brief in your uh, analysis? Yes. Otherwise, uh, the, the other uh, colleagues cannot ask their question to yes. you as well. I, I shall try to be brief, although there are a couple of things that I should address uh, and, uh, um, urgently. The first is that, um, very clearly, the, the recession that occurred during the COVID crisis was a recession and not degrowth. It, it, it entailed no policies that have been proposed by degrowth advocates. Um, and so it's just a typical recession that growth-oriented economies suffer. Um, uh, as a consequence of them being growth oriented, right? So it's a problem within the existing system. Uh, so to the question of green growth has never been tried, this is not true, it, it has been. The OECD has been running a uh, green growth program uh, since 2009 with many nations signed up and none of the nations signed up to the green growth policy platform have succeeded in, uh, in achieving sufficiently uh, 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 dramatic reductions in emissions and materials, okay? South Korea is often held up as an example of green, green growth policy. South Korea has increased its emissions uh, during the, the, green, the green growth policy program, so that's not working. Um, uh, you say that we have no idea whether uh, green growth can, can achieve the objectives you suggest, but we do, because we have science, and scientists have models, and, I, and we look at models. Um, and that's what we base our critique of green growth on. And you have not addressed, unfortunately, any of the scientific evidence um, on this issue and not addressed any of my own critiques. And I think that uh, we, need, uh, we need more there. Um, so, but to this very urgent question about people's vulnerability, uh, just to briefly address that and then I hope I can speak more later. Um, the idea that we need growth to reduce people's vulnerability and to bring them on board with climate action and so on. I don't buy this, and that's because growth is not reducing people's vulnerability, right? People are vulnerable despite generations of growth because, because this vulnerability is built into the way our economy works, okay? So we need to address that vulnerability directly through the policies that I proposed, strong social policies that can end economic insecurity now without waiting for several more generations of growth to magically achieve those objectives. So we, we know that people um, support strong ecological measures um, unless their, their livelihoods are on the line. For good reason, they care about their livelihoods. So let us deal with that issue directly, um, again, with the policies I've proposed. It's not that they want more growth, right? They want economic security. So let us have an economy that, that does that, that ensures that for all, and, uh, and I think that would significantly change our politics. Thank you very much. Could you um, 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dijssen, uh, he's from the uh, uh, party for uh, Labour, Labour Party. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the speakers to be here today. It's very inspiring. And I have also a question for um, Mr. Hickel, because I understand that you're saying let's, let's make sure that we put our production means around the stuff that's really important to society, like housing, nutritious food, uh, all that kind of stuff. And make sure that the people that are working there, they have a livable wage. They can actually buy food and have a housing from the wage that they get. So what we're proposing, for example, is that we increase the minimum wage in the Netherlands to make sure that people have a living wage. But then, of course, immediately the, 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 um, uh, the government says, yeah, well, but that will cost x billion euros to actually pay for that. So if we don't have growth and we don't have more taxations that we can that we can get in how do we pay for this in your degrowth proposal yeah, sir. thank you for the question um it's an important one i i find it a bit odd this claim that um you have to have <laughs> you have to have a production of things that we don't need in order to produce things that we do need okay so we have to produce more super yachts and suvs in order to produce things like uh health and uh, public transit. This is a very strange claim, or, or if you think about it. Um, and, and the assumption seems to be that corporations produce money, and the government needs to use the money from corporate production <laughs> in order to fund public production. This is clearly not the case. Corporations don't produce money. Governments and banks produce money, right? And so right now, um, uh, Right, uh, the majority of money creation is just funneled straight into the, into the hands of corporations and wealthy individuals um, through commercial lending and so on, right? We can, we can shift the process of finance to, uh, to direct it towards the objectives, the social and ecological objectives we want to achieve. Um, this idea that, we, that, that governments have to tax first before they, they can spend, before they can produce is not true, this is a myth. Uh, governments can, sp can spend directly um, uh, through funding public services directly. Uh, and I think that work by Stephanie Kelton and Mariana Mazzucato is very important in, uh, in, in revealing this. So this is a myth that we have to, um, we have to address. Uh, um, as Keynes put it, and I think he put it most eloquently, whatever we can physically do, we can afford, right? Because what really matters is the real productive capacities of the economy, our real labor capacities, our real resource and energy capacities. We know that we have the capacity to do the things that I'm proposing. Uh, and so they are, therefore, by definition, affordable. OK. Madam Teunissen, she's from the Party for the Animals. Thank you very much. It was a very inspiring talk of the both of you. Um, I still uh, I want to have a follow-up question uh, uh, after uh, Mr. Tyson, because I still have this question about how do we uh, as Barma Barsma said, there, there's this, this ideology which says we need growth to, public, to, to fund the public needs that we have, education, healthcare, etc. But also the energy transition. We need, that to, to, we need money to, to make that possible. Um, and you said just now, like we can fund public services in a fundamental different way than we do now. Um, so maybe you can specify that, and my question is for Mr. Hickel. Can you specify a bit more how uh, that looks, li looks like? How, how can we fund uh, health care and, and other public services while not growing anymore? Mr. So, Hickel. So I'll try to put this uh, as, as simply as I can in kind of plain terms, and that is that, again, what, what matters here is our actual productive capacities. Right now, our productive capacities are organized uh, in destructive ways, in largely destructive and socially less necessary ways, in the ways I've described, right? We can shift that production towards more socially and ecologically necessary forms of production. And so, again, instead of building super yachts and SUVs, uh, for instance, we can be producing uh, renewable energy capacity and, uh, and regenerative food and so on now. Um, Money is simply an abstract representation of control over productive capacity. And so the, the method I'm proposing here simply sh shifts productive capacity in a new direction, uh, one that is more democratic, one that is more organized around the public interest. Um, and, uh, and it's more or less as straightforward as that. And I would, um, I mean, of course, there, there, are, there are, for technical details, you will need to hold a hearing with 
um, individuals who have expertise in monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, and I would urge you to do so, but, uh, but um, it, is, uh, it is more or less along those lines. Mr. De Jong, D66. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. Hickel. Some proponents of degrowth argue that it's necessary to address uh, the root cause of economic growth, such as uh, capitalism or consumerism. How do you see the relationship between degrowth um, and these broader social and economic uh, structures and what role can degrowth uh, play into that? Um, I, I'm not sure I quite caught the specific question. Can you, can you repeat that part again? Well, you can see from traditional line, you can see the consumerism and, and capitalism uh, build the structures such as we have. And you're pulling up a, a brand new idea, looking at the economy. But how to change these systems, how to, to get the structure also into the minds of consumers and also to companies, it's a big challenge. So I'm looking for the broader relationship between those. OK, yeah. Um, well, I think that the, the main thing here is that we need, we need a political narrative that is focused on the importance of, of, of what we agree on, which is, which is shifting the economy to focus on human well-being and ecology rather than on capital accumulation. Uh, right, so that's the first thing. And then the, the second thing, I think, is simply taking, um, taking some of the policy steps that I've suggested here. Um, the, uh, the public job guarantee is perhaps, I think, one of the most powerful first steps that one could take, uh, in the sense that it's an extremely popular measure. Um, it allows us to, to mobilize labor around, uh, around imp socially important use value production that, we, that is not occurring right now because it's not profitable to do, right? But we need to be doing it. Uh, and it allows us to set wages at, li at a living wage standard. And also, we can use the job guarantee to shorten the working week. So we offer it at 30 hours a week, for example, let's say. This, um, this, uh, this creates a standard in the economy that forces other employers, other producers, to, to follow suit. And so it can be a very powerful way of, uh, of, of achieving pretty rapid reform in the economy. Um, it also, critically, and this is so important, I think, um, eliminates the economic insecurity that so plagues our politics right now, that makes it impossible for us to, to talk about sensible measures, um, like scaling down less necessary forms of production because of the threat that, that this poses to livelihoods and employment. So we must deal with that question first, and I think that a policy like that could be really important. So I, I urge politicians and political parties to explore uh, some of these, these uh, progressive policies and see, and see how it changes the conversation. Mr. Erkens, Liberal Party. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for letting me go first, uh, because I have to leave to another meeting at 12. And thanks for your uh, presentations as well. Um, I have a question on um, the use of pricing as an instrument as well, because you just had a discussion amongst uh, each other as well about it. Um, it hasn't happened enough in the past, but I think the European ETS system is one of the first systems that's starting to bite a little bit in giving an incentive to companies to uh, disinvest in less CO2 emissions. But if you would then decide not to go for a pricing instrument and you would pick degrowth, who will then make the decisions um, what we will consume or not consume? Because super yachts, of course, yeah, it's an easy example, but it's an oversimplification, of course, of reality, because I think there's like a thousand a year that are bought or something like that. Uh, but when you get really to the nitty gritty details of people's daily lives, who should then make a decision on what is a, a just product that they should be able to use and what is not? Is it bureaucrats, politicians? I feel it could be very illiberal a society like this. No, 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 no. I'd be very against that as well. I join you <laughs> in this concern. No, uh, for me, uh, a democratic process is essential. Now, what this looks like, I think we have to explore. Um, but, uh, but, but the citizens' assemblies that have been officially convened in places like France and Spain, for instance, I think offer us uh, interesting glimpses into what uh, this could be, no? Um, where there's a, a democratic del deliberation about what forms of production we need to be w focusing on and what forms uh, we, we should scale down in the middle of an ecological emergency. Um, people can agree on these things uh, when you have a democratic space that uh, is, is free of media disinformation and, uh, and campaign finance funds and so on. No? So, um, so, so, crea so creating a properly democratic space to have a conversation like this is important. And, and really, uh, and really, this is the ultimate democratic act, right? We say we live in a democracy, no? And yet our economic system is not democratic. Uh, I think that this is something we need to face up to. If, we value, if we're Democrats, no, if we value democracy, 
then we should be applying these principles to the realm of production, to the economy. And that's what uh, I think needs to occur in the face of the ecological crisis, so that we can effectively address both social and ecological problems together. Mr. Amaus, CDA, Christian Democrat Party. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a nice discussion today. Uh, and I don't agree with that, that, that green growth isn't there yet. If I look to the, uh, to the historical perspective, there was, was already many years ago, uh, decades uh, years ago, that we every time move with green steps. So it is not a big bang. So I, I, I believe uh, green growth is, is, is possible. But my question is uh, morely, uh, how does the, the, the story of uh, Mr. Hickel uh, feeds in, in the SDG 8? That's about decent work and economic growth. Because we have the discussion now from the West and we have the developing countries. And we are not on an island. Because that is, I think, also, if we want to have a change, you are also have uh, the relations and the, 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 the value change with it's globally. So your story, if you reflect that also on, on our goal, that's one of our uh, SDG goals, uh, uh, decent work and economic growth, what is your reflection on that? Well, I think it's abundantly clear that low-income economies will require an increase in aggregate production in order to, to achieve development goals and meet human needs. But no one's talking about degrowth in, uh, in the global south. This is specifically about the, the, core, the, the core nations, the high-income nations of the, of the world economy that are, again, overwhelmingly responsible for driving the ecological crisis. And furthermore, uh, work against the uh, uh, development objectives in the global south. <laughs> Because the economies of the high-income nations rely on an extraordinary plunder of resources and labor from the South. This is, these are productive capacities that could be directed elsewhere towards meeting human needs um, domestically, and yet are organized around sweatshop production to service uh, you know, Western corporations. Uh, this is not, I mean, the existing system is not working for development. Um, and, uh, and it's extremely exploitative and destructive with overwhelmingly negative consequences for the global south. And so I think that, um, that for the sake of global justice precisely, we need to be talking about, about a post-growth transition in the, in the rich countries. Madam Van der Graaf, Christian Union. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hickel. Thank you, Mrs. Bersma, for this vibrant discussion. I think your, both your messages are very good to hear, to be heard uh, in this parliament uh, today. Um, so I enjoy this meeting very much. I would like to address my question actually to Mr. Hickel, um, because I, am, I would like to know from you uh, to share with us uh, some concrete examples of policies that you see in other countries of post-growth that improves life, uh, living um, within the planetary boundaries, within our, the carrying capacity of the Earth. So, um, so unfortunately, uh, no uh, high-income nation has yet attempted a post-growth transition. This is, uh, this is a conversation that's emerging now, and uh, political parties are beginning, beginning to pick these ideas up. And so it's not like we, you can point to a single example. But there are, there are certainly examples where, these, where policies along these lines have been, have been tried with excellent uh, effects. So, for example, uh, the idea of a job guarantee is really not new. I mean, it's been used in high-income countries many times in the past. Um, with strong effects, including, for example, in the wake of the Great Depression in the United States, uh, quite popularly. Um, the idea of, of working time reduction is right now a major, a major issue of scientific research with very powerful effects. Um, uh, studies on, on, four day, on a shift to a four-day work week have been incredibly popular uh, um, among the, uh, the firms that have, that have trialed it. Um, and we know have very, very positive effects on human well-being and gender equality and, uh, and health and so on. Um, so, and, and of course, now there's also a very rich discussion occurring about, uh, about shifting to, to uh, metrics that are not GDP in terms of uh, measuring progress. No? And I think that uh, that's a rich conversation that, that should be encouraged and, um, and advanced here in the Netherlands as well. Um, but of course, we have to understand that that alone will, will not be enough itself. I mean, a, a deeper transition of the economy will, will be required, rather than just simply measuring different things. But it's an important first step. Thank you. Uh, Madam Kreuger, a green left. Yeah, I had a question about the planetary boundaries, because I think 
uh, both of you are clearly describing that uh, the issue of climate justice and redistribution is really at the heart of the climate debate. Uh, but we're currently very much focusing on CO2 as one of the boundaries, uh, while um, in our energy transition, we're actually using a lot of resources from elsewhere, both human resources and um, natural resources. Um, Mr. Hickel calls it plunder, uh, I heard you say. Um, so if we would take these boundaries, would that also mean that geopolitically you would be more um, focusing on production within Europe? And how would that affect international trade? So how would your story, the, the, the narrative of uh, staying within these boundaries affect international trade and also the possibilities of, uh, of other countries to join an international economy? So, uh, so, so the way the world economy works um, is deeply unfair to global South countries um, because they've, um, they've been subject to structural adjustment programs uh, since the 1980s uh, imposed by the World Bank and the IMF that have more or less forced them into a position where they don't have any economic or, monet or very limited economic and monetary sovereignty. This prevents them from mobilizing their own productive capacities around domestic, uh, around sovereign industrial developments uh, for domestic needs and for regional trade, and instead coerces them into a position where they are, um, where they're servicing uh, global supply chains, mostly for uh, Western corporations, for instance. So, in this arrangement, clearly, uh, Global South countries have become dependent, in many cases, on exports to the Global North, and a reduction in that demand would have negative effects on Global South countries, but this is, uh, this is the thing that we want to change. And so any post-growth transition in the rich countries must also urgently come along with policies to uh, enable Global South countries to have more economic and monetary and fiscal sovereignty so they can remobilize production around human development objectives which is presently very difficult for them to do uh, because of constraints uh, imposed on them. So, um, so, so we need a fairer international trade and finance system that, uh, that allows Global South countries to take sensible steps towards, uh, towards sovereign development. Madam Teunissen, uh, Party for the Animals. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is for Mr. Hickel. You said this morning in an interview uh, with uh, one of our newspapers that uh, we should uh, reduce our production of SUVs, that it's ridiculous that we still produce them because uh, we can't do any more because of climate change. And according to a report about a fair share, we have now about um, 9 million cars in the Netherlands. Um, and we only have resources for a million electrical cars. So it's not possible to, to grow and to have more electrical cars, cars than one million in the Netherlands while we have nine million cars. So my question is, how do we make this shift? And how does a, what, what should we do in the Netherlands to make, make a mobile shift? Not towards electrical cars, but towards a total different system. And how does the system look like? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, clearly... Uh, Madam Baersma, could you... Thank you. Clearly, electric, electric cars are much better than uh, fossil fuel cars. Nobody would disagree with this. So we obviously need them for where cars are necessary. They're the future of, they're the future of cars, but they're not the future of transport, right? Um, and, uh, you know, the idea that we will replace every single combustion engine car with an electric car and also have electric SUVs and electric Hummers or whatever, this is, this is fantasy. Um, it would require, I mean, it requires an extraordinary amount of extraction. And where is that extraction going to occur? Not here in the Netherlands. Uh, it's, it's, it's an extraction that's imposed on vulnerable communities in the Global South, and already we're seeing negative effects there now. So, um, so it's much more urgent that we, uh, we shift our mindset about mobility and prioritize you know, uh, high quality, modern, affordable public transit and, and biking uh, in order to um, ensure strong and even improved access to mobility without relying so heavily on, on private cars, which are um, extraordinarily materially uh, and energy and cost intensive. Uh, so, um, so to me, this is, yeah, this is quite a straightforward uh, shift that needs to occur. Um, because we see that consumption growth is uh, a problem. Um, if you look at how effective <coughs> our policies are on um, uh, environmental and, and climate uh, issues. Um, so I saw also the IPCC um, uh, in the latest uh, IPCC re report that addressed uh, actually many uh, 
pages to measures uh, um, aimed at a demand side uh, mitigation to adjust uh, consumption patterns. And um, they also expect uh, that, that that would have um, a huge effect actually on our policy. So I, I would like to uh, learn from you both what would be your advice to the Dutch government on what policies we should um, uh, put in place to influence consumption patterns um, to make our policies on climate and environmental uh, issues more effective. Um, yeah, yeah, so this is actually quite important. So, uh, as you mentioned, the IPCC actually, actually devoted an entire chapter in their last report um, to, to demand-side mitigation. And this is becoming uh, a, a lever that they see as increasingly important, okay? And, um, but I don't think we should, th we should think about this necessarily in terms of individual consumption. We should think about it in terms of what the economy is producing, um, uh, right? And so this is not really a matter of like individual consumer choice um, or behavior. Uh, I don't think there's much to be gained in, in blaming consumers like this, but, um, but, but rather thinking about the production system. So, uh, and we have, we have really interesting research on this. I mean, uh, demand side mitigation can, can reduce emissions really dramatically and very quickly. Um, uh, in the UK, demand side mitigation can cut energy use by 55% um, while improving and supporting human well being, right? This is very exciting research. Uh, and, 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 it, and again, like I mentioned, it brings the, the possibility of staying under 1.5 degrees back on the table without relying on magic, on magical technologies or, uh, or unjust approaches. And so that's quite important. And in terms of the, the, the demand reduction policies, I mean, they're as I suggested now. We have to think about scaling down uh, less necessary forms of production. And that's, that's what really uh, drives the change. But, um, but the other element of demand side is, is not just avoid, is what they call it, but also, but also shift. So, uh, so shifting from you know uh, private transport to public transit, um, you know shifting towards n uh, nutritious plant-based diets, etc., uh, deliver really extraordinary gains. Um, so, well, I'm just asking you to give us a sense of priority in what we should be doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, again, uh, normally when I'm asked about this, w w one of the things that I promote first is, is, the, pu is the public job guarantee. And I think that that's, that that's something that should be part of our political debates and, uh, and should, be, should be explored and considered. Um, uh, but again, uh, for me, uh, and I know there are questions asked about universal public services earlier, but the, uh, the evidence we have on, on the impact that universal public services um, uh, means for people's well-being and access to, to decent living is extraordinary. Uh, it's extremely important. And, um, and we should be mobilizing our productive capacities around that. And I believe quite confidently that, that, that when we do this, when we secure well-being in this way, then it will change the, the political space that we have to talk about ecology and climate um, more honestly uh, and more directly without the kind of fear and insecurity that presently plagues this conversation and makes it so politically difficult. Um, and so I would urge the, uh, the Green parties and the environmentalist parties to take social policy very seriously. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hickel and Madam uh, Baarsma. A broad majority of the, uh, of the parliament was here today. Unfortunately, we have several other meetings at the same time planned, and it's very difficult sometimes for all of the members to be uh, present in all, all of the debates and uh, roundtable conversations. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I will round up this uh, uh, meeting. And I wish you all a very blessed day, the people who were here in the room and the people watching uh, through the internet. And thank you again for coming and uh, talking to us. What did you think about just an equal argument? Did you find these arguments in favor of the growth convincing? What would be, according to you, a good economic system to integrate our planetary limits and make the world a better place for all? Let us know what you think in the comments and let's continue to evolve together toward a new world, one in which we can live in harmony and sustainably together.